P I R T L E J W. Okay. Um, well, I'm here to interview you today about um, you know community violence. You know, seeing that you're uh, a part of WBCP Radio, I thought that you um, you know would know a lot about you know things that was going that that went down in the community um, back then. Oh my gracious, man! You're gonna make me go back and tell you my age. <laughs> <laughs> back then and um, and now, so. Um, basically, we want to talk about like, you know, how the community has changed from when it was back then. You know, violence. Well, basically, if you look at it, the violence hadn't changed that much. Now you've got more of it now mm -hmm. because there are more people. Uh, I would go back probably to the '60s, and uh, that's when we originally first got into our so-called gangs in Champaign County, for as the blacks are concerned. And that went through the 60s and early 70s, and then it sort of just faded out. And were you were you involved in the gang? Oh no, I, I never never been a part of the gangs. I, I always felt that that's a waste of my time. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, find something better to do with your time and to get involved with gangs. Uh, I always always felt that gangs were for people who didn't want to do a lot of thinking for themselves. Mm -hmm. They want somebody else to think for them, so they join the gang and let that person do their thinking, so they just follow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, well, could you like, you know, give us some um, things that happened back back in your time when you were, you know, growing up like us? <laughs> if you now you're going way back. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but as I said, it really hadn't changed that much. It's just more. Mm -hmm. uh, History repeats itself, and if you look at it, and you can't do it as well as I can, uh, the same problem was going on in the so-called black community back in the 50s, 40s, maybe earlier than that, but at least back in those days, uh, as I said earlier, the most things that's happened to it, it's more, more people involved. And our community has lost a lot from uh, all the people being involved that carried on the negative. See, uh, I'm one of the old school who believes that uh, when we taken the the spatter rod from the parents, mm -hmm. that happened during the 50s and 60s. Uh, our kids seem to want to run wild. They were running wild before, but the parents put them back in line. Uh, maybe the aunt or the uncle, but today that's not happening. And I've always criticized that for the, the system of this country. Uh, this is a per, I would say it's it's, it's real pro progressive type of system. What do you call this country? Democracy? Yeah, or but you call it something else. What do you call it? Uh, well, it's, it's all about progress and, and materialistic money. and money mm -hmm. yeah. and when you stop and look at it if you're not about money you're not going to go too far in this country this is a not a non-political country but this really political mm -hmm. it used to be a part of one of the systems you know to really move in this this country uh, it's a capitalist society that's what I'm trying to say mm. and if you're not a part of it you won't be in it. And if you notice and you look around as you're a young kid growing up, you will notice that uh, most people who progress in this country is a progressive type of person. Mm -hmm. Now you'd be progressive two different ways, in the negative way and the positive way. Most people who progress in this country is from the positive side of that. Because if you look around your age and his age, that's, that's a handful of young people that's going in the wrong direction. The other 85 or 90 percent is going on about their business, working every day, going to school every day, doing something positive. So what do you feel about um, the, the dropout, you know, from high school dropout back then? You know, was that... It was some then. Is it, has it, do you think that it's changed now than it was? Uh, as I said earlier, it hadn't changed that much, it's just more. 
So you had high school dropouts back in the 50s and 60s, but instead of having one or two dropouts, you got 10 or 15 now. And if you look at the school system and set up, I think you, what is, it? what is in Champaign? It's a very high dropout uh, in the black community. And a lot of that is just because parents don't care that much anymore. And back in the 50s and 60s, the parents cared and their grandparents cared and the aunts and uncles cared. But nowadays, they care but they don't care because the laws have changed. See, your aunt can't come over there and discipline you like she could 50 years ago. See, because uh, if you do, they'll have her in front of the judge someplace here in Champaign County. Mm -hmm. So that has hurt to a certain degree uh, because people have lost respect for the law because a lot of kids think that, well, I don't have to do those things anymore. It's not that you have to. It's what's best for you. Uh, and in, in my opinion is that a lot of people nowadays think that they can get away doing anything. But you really can't get away doing anything if you live very long. As I try to tell a lot of young men, you can make a living working, or you can make a living out here in the streets. <coughs> but I'll tell you one thing, you won't be su successful out there in the street, they, as they call hustling, not very long. Either you're going to be in jail, you're going to be killed, or you're going to be in prison. One of those three things is going to happen. And if you look at the the young men's here in Champaign, most of them have a very short span of life. I'm talking about the ones that you might say out here in these streets. Mm -hmm. That life span is very short. Um, so what is your position on like, I, I heard you say that you um, you think that we, you know, uh, young people have lost, you know, a lot of respect for the law. Mm -hmm. What is, do you remember hearing about the Kiwan Carrington case? Yeah. What, what was your position on that? Well, that's a real touchy situation there. Again, Kiwan, in my opinion, never had a real good chance in life. Now, you might look at it and say, well, why you say that? Because he didn't, he wasn't raised up with parents. And he, uh, I think if, from what I understand, he was mostly raised up from relatives to a certain degree, maybe a mother now and then. But when I heard about that, I was just reading the paper and, and listening to the news. I said, why was he shot at between 1 and 3 o'clock in the afternoon? He should have been in school. Now, if he wasn't in school, they said that he was in what, some type of upper class. Um, I think it was a reform school. Well, something yeah. similar to that. Yeah. Still, it's his fault. Why was he in that type of school? It goes back to why did he get put in a special school from the other kids? So somebody didn't tell him all along, you shouldn't be in this, you should be in this type of school so you can keep going. So I don't give people's credit for, for something like that because you haven't heard me say a word other than to you all about Kiwan because I haven't said anything about it because I don't believe in really talking negative things. I think positive things is what happened. Mm -hmm. And my opinion was from the start, if he had been trained, he wouldn't have been put in that special school setting type of thing. And between 1 o'clock and 3 o'clock, he would have been in a regular school doing like 80% of the, 90% of the other kids. So he wouldn't have been out there trying to get in this house. So if you look at it on that basis, that's positive that he should have been in it, but he wasn't, he was in the negative side of it. Um, well, do you think that, um, that the reason that um, he got killed was because he wasn't, you know, trying to obey what the, what the you know, law was telling him to do? Well, I can't say in that situation because I don't know. Mm -hmm. 
all I know, my opinion, he shouldn't have been in that position. And by that I'm saying he should have been in school. Now there are people saying, well, the law shouldn't have shot him. I don't know that. But I know one thing, at his age, he should have been in school. He shouldn't have been over in no special ed school or no special school for someone who hadn't caused problems in the school. He should have been in a regular school with all the rest of the kids starting at 1.30 to 3 o'clock or 2 o'clock all of that time. He shouldn't have been in that position. And if he had been trained all along from a little baby, he wouldn't have been in that position. Position. Look at all the, the young boys and girls who wasn't in that position, who was at school that time of day. So look at the positive part of that. Look at the negatives and see, okay, this is what I want to do in life. I don't want to be in that position. Um, well, were you um, around when... Uh the Black Panthers came aboard? I was here when they started here in Champaign. They had the Peace Stone, the Panthers, and I don't know, it was about four groups back in the 60s. Can you tell us a little, a little more, a bit more about that? Again, I didn't get involved in it. I, as I said, I've never been a game type of person. I always wanted to do what I consider positive things in life, and I figured that those people's really didn't want to do a lot of positive things and they didn't want to think for themselves. Uh, they wanted somebody else to think for them. Uh, another reason why a lot of young men and women get in game because they want attention. And they don't get attention from them mothers and fathers, uh, sisters and brothers. So in a way to get attention they got to go out and get into games. And the gang leaders and the people involved in the gangs give them credit for you are this and you are that. But uh, you still can get the attention by being doing some positive things in the community. Okay. Um, were you any part of the uh, NAACP? I'm a still a member of that organization. I think it did a lot for our race of people. You and I probably wouldn't be sitting here today if it wasn't for the NAACP. So do you think that, um, in other words, you think that the NAACP is, you know, a big, you know, something that uh, really changed? Oh, that changed this country. Mm -hmm. No doubt. It changed this country. And uh, you have to give credit wherever you do it. And a lot of the peoples back in the days when that was really going on real strong, I give them a lot of credit because I tell people all the time, we probably wouldn't be in this position if we hadn't been for Martin Luther King. But uh, that don't mean we have to go, go around, excuse me, uh, disrespecting him. Uh, can you cut that off? Um, well, could you tell us a little something about the way that you were raised? Well, I happen to be very fortunate to be raised by a two parents family, mother and father. And uh, my father used to always say, if you can't tell somebody something good and right, don't say anything. So I had lots of confidence in him and my mother that they was going to tell me the right thing. A lot of time I didn't like it, but back in those days, you didn't have much of a choice. Uh, you did what they tell you to do, and if you didn't do it, uh, something you didn't happen. Something you happened to you did you didn't like. Now, when you got to the place in the age that you felt that that was not what you're gonna take anymore, you decided to leave home. But other than that, you did what you was told to do. And as I said, I don't think my mother and father told me anything wrong. As I said, some of those things I didn't like, but that's growing up to being a young man, a young boy. Did you grow up here? In no, I grew up in in uh, Tennessee, Iceberg, Tennessee. Yeah. Um. So, could you tell us, like, you know, I know that you're, um, like I said earlier, I know that you're into the radio thing. Could you tell us about just maybe a couple of stories that you may have come across, you know, while in that, in that position? Well, that's a, I don't know, it's 
the history of WBCP radio station is goes back 20, 21 years. Lonnie Clark, Vern Bostall, who used to hit up the Urban League, and myself, we went into the radio business 21 years ago. And all three of us didn't know nothing about it. Uh, but uh, the bank and some other people felt that it was an asset to this community. And uh, the three of us would do a good job. And I knock on some wood somewhere. I guess we had. Vern passed about 10 years ago. But Lana is nice to keep it in. I, I still think it's an asset to the community. Because, again, if we didn't have WBCP, there's a lot of information that would not get out in this community. Because you can only get so much from the public service station, which is WEF. And the other commercial radio stations is only going to give you what the, re the law requires them to do which is very little. So we distributed a lot more information to this community. Plus we have a lot of direct things that direct impacts the black community we have, like the talk shows and all that. And that impacts the whole community that they wouldn't get if they had to deal with another radio station because they would have to pay for it. And a lot of the organizations around wouldn't pay for it. So it's, it's a positive image to the community. Um, could you tell us some of the, like you know some of the positive people that um, that you know came on the radio show and helped you out with that? Well, when we first opened up, we had a a general manager, uh, and we give her the authority to go out and hire the staff, and she hired everybody that worked there for the first six or seven years. That mean the program director, the air shifters, the uh, air shifter program directors. Well, heck, I can't think of the name of all those positions. <laughs> but see, radio has changed. So you don't need all those people nowadays. Uh, the radio business has gone into more of the commercial side where you can buy the, comp the uh, uh, programs and you don't have to have anybody at the station to do it. You can buy them over the satellite. Mm -hmm. And most of our satellite, most of our music is all coming in on the satellite. Uh, so that, where well, we used to have three peoples every day working, three different shifts, we don't have one now. That one person do the whole day because we don't need somebody in there keep pushing carts in or keep making announcements. They come right over there uh, through the satellite now. So I remember about five years after we was in business, that's when they first started the satellite business of the radio. And one of the program directors said to the DJ, he said, hey, fellas, you all better get on the ball right here because pretty soon they're not going to need you all. And no, I don't think I even knew it. I knew a lot of the other people didn't know. That was coming. And now you can buy any kind of program you want from gospel, to jazz, blues, any kind of music that you want, right over the satellite out there in the air. You, all you do is call up the company, or ABC or some of the other companies, and they'll just satellite it into you. You just have to have a receiver that you can get it. And some of them charge you so much a month, and some of them will do it just because they want you to sell their commercials. We have Doug Banks, Tom Jarner, all those real popular black programs, Al Sharpton, and they all satellite it in. You know, we don't we don't have to pay anything. We just have to run the commercials that they want us to run. And they send the commercials right over the satellite. So you won't even see none of those people at the radio station, but the commercials will come through. Okay. Um I seen uh on T V the other day you speaking down at the uh the city hall. Okay. Could you tell us a little bit about um, playing baseball? Oh, okay. That was you being African. Well, I remember, I was on the council for 22 years, so I had to. You had to tell me about that. Oh, let me get that phone.